give a quick run through the logistics of producing the uh, bird atlas or seeing our venue, I suppose I should say a counter. Um, so the production of the bird atlas, as um, with any project, can be divided into conception, gestation and birth. So the conception had happened um, before I joined the team. On the back of the BTO Atlas, British Trust for Oncology ran a national atlas between 2007 and 2011. And we were offered as counties the opportunity to use their database to gather a little bit more evidence if we wanted to produce county atlases. We did. Um, <coughs> the BTO had wanted eight tetrads done, which is a tetrad of two by two kilometre square, <coughs> uh, ten kilometre square. Um, we wanted all 25 done, so that's three times as much work. Um, I joined this in 2010, <coughs> so we were already three years into it. So it was a little bit of a challenge to get this work done. However, <coughs> we set off on our first trimester, um, which was data gathering, and obviously the data gathering is observations. Observations of the birds being our most important feature. Um, time tetrad visits were the baseline for the, for the atlas. These were visits done four times, twice during the breeding season and twice during the winter season in every tetrad. And these allowed us to do some statistics on the data that we gathered. Just allocating the tetrads is a bit of a challenge. And as you can see, um, it wasn't until December 2012 that all the tech grants were actually allocated. Allocating of the report is not the same as having them done. Which is a quite such a good picture. But by the end of the following year, all the data had been gathered. So as well as the time tech grants and visits, um, people submitted roaming records. These are records of individual birds which could be a single word or a flock, didn't have to be related to any time. And these are, related, these are presented as just the present category in the atlas. Finally, breeding records. The BTO, again, only required the breeding to be confirmed in one tetrad to enable the breeding to be confirmed in that 10 kilometer square. Obviously, we want to get confirmed in all 25. Observations were put into the system or allowed to be submitted to the system until 31st of July. And the cutoff date was 31st of October to allow for the date entry. All those records then had to be validated. A huge amount of work undertaken by largely by Peter Robinson, who is our validator, with Mark Darliston doing the schedule of factors. In addition to the numbers of birds, we wanted photographs. We had three requests for these photographs. Firstly, that they were taken within the county of Devon. And I have to say at this stage, unfortunately, it wasn't quite possible to achieve that, but it nearly was. They had to be superb quality. And they had to be aesthetically pleasing. So I'll just show you two or three of those now. And I think you, you agree that um, the quality there is pretty stunning. This picture of Avocets just completely blew me away. Um, so much so that this will be on the fly leaves for the front of that fly leaves of the book. And if that isn't aesthetically pleasing, I don't know what it is. <coughs> okay, so having gathered the data, we then have to play with it. Um, so firstly, the data manipulation. We receive BTO downloads as comma-separated files. Mike Hanson was our statistics and mapping expert, and he dealt with all these. At some point, um, 
I don't quite know how we realised that some records were missing, and we realised that the veto hadn't downloaded the last two years of test records, so we finally got those. And then we realised that there were also some records missing from periods in that last two years, and it became obvious because they hadn't given us the months that were not included in the TEPRA periods. So we finally got all those, and all the data was in by October 2014. It was submitted by 1,200 recorders, and between them they submitted over a million records. It was just a stunning effort, and without all those, of course, none of this would have been possible. Um, so we then had to map it for the purpose of that, was obviously the maps. Um, <coughs> we used a program called DMAP. We produced two maps. Abundance maps, which as I said were done by the by manipulating the TechRed data, and we did breeding maps, which are just dot maps. We wanted to do these so we could compare with the previous Devon Atlas of country setters for 1988. So the types of map that we produce. These are the abundance maps, so nice hot colours for summer, because of course we get nice hot summers, <laughs> and cold colours for winter. This is a sitters uh, dot map, and for the same species, this is our dot map. As you see, we have an additional category for present, which um, sitters didn't have. But we're hoping that all this that we've presented now will enable the next atlas in 20 years' time, when none of us will be volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's not appropriate to map every species at um, tetrad level. So some are mapped at 10 kilometer level. If they're a bit sensitive, this is peregrine. And some are not mapped at all, such as Gosselka. So then we have to um, write the texts. Um, two aspects needed to be addressed, the species accounts and the introductory chapters. So for both of these we need to find authors and we needed to receive the text. And a bit similar to the tetrads, receiving the text isn't the same as the author saying they're going to do them. <laughs> However, But I just thought I'd run through the species accounts for you, what, what happens to them, and to just show you how busy Mark and I have been. Um, they have four edits, initially, two by Mike and two by myself. They then returned to the authors. You see, I don't think you noticed that, I'll just go back. You notice that the species accounts has gone up a bit, because I realised I didn't have enough space. <laughs> um, they then have another two edits, and come back from the authors again, one by Mike, one by myself. They're then subject to peer review. That's peer review for the data content and peer review for the statistics. So two peer reviews. That came up with further edits required. Then went for typesetting, and that may or may not have uh, reviewed, uh, revealed further edits. Into layout which also may reveal further edits. So, we end up with a species account, a standard breeding account, it's two pages, and we have the four maps, and an account, another picture, and additional data that is available. For the introductory chapters and appendices, we were very, very fortunate to have a lot of experts on the Atlas team. We have Mike, who's an expert in the botany and natural areas. We had a geologist, and we had Mike, who did the mapping and statistics. Appendices, of course, are gathered as, um, as you read through the chapters. So this is a page from an initial chapter, and these pages of the Atlas are being presented next door, so I hope you'll enjoy those. So after all this work, 
<laughs> All I can say is in the delivery station. <laughs> so, thank you, and I'll hand over to my colleagues, Mike, to continue with uh, some of what we found. Well, thank you very much for all coming, and it falls to me to give some of the results that we have from this. Obviously, at the time I have, there isn't the possibility of going into more than a few examples, but I'll do my, do my best. We do have the huge advantage in this atlas of um, having the earlier Humphrey Sitter's Atlas, published in 1988 and based on fieldwork in 1977-85. So we have a comparison that spans approximately 30 years. Although this is, of course, for breeding species only, because Sitter's did not deal with winter abundance and winter species. In a nutshell, we have 11 gains, 34 statistically significant increases, 52 species which show no significant change, 60 species that show significant decreases, and nine losses. The, not, the gains and losses may look impressive, but don't worry too much about them. They're mostly species that were either here one or two years at a time, or were hanging on by the skin of their teeth at, the, at best. But they are, they are there as indicators. I should, however, mention one species, and that is the little egret. This is not even in the Sitter's Atlas. It first bred in 2002 in the county, and there are now about 50 pairs on the south, mainly on south coast estuaries. And that's a bird that has arrived here entirely under its own steam. Nobody's helped it, it's just gone on with it. Why, we're not sure. Perhaps it's uh, global warming, who knows. Increases include a wide range of species, including little grebe, Canada goose, crossbill, tufted duck, sedge warbler, raven, lesser black back gull, and siskin. The siskin is a nice example of a species that has increased. It's, in the earlier survey, it was present in 2%, just 2% of tetrads, mostly in fine plantations on Dartmoor. It's now in 22% of tetrads. And it's a small finch, confined to conifers for breeding anyway, and it comes to garden feeders. And what it is, is that this bird appears to have adapted itself to a new food source. <coughs> and uh, so that's why we now have more, probably why we have more systems than we used to. And if you compare the two maps, you probably can't see the individual dots, but you can see where it was in the early survey it was around Dartmoor and it was on Holden. Now it's all over the place. It's still where it was, but it's all over the place. Species which show no change. There are, again, quite a few of them. Um, And um, they include such things as mute swan, wood pigeon, great spotted woodpecker, great tip, house sparrow, and 35 others. There's a lot of things there. Losses, birds that were on the brink at the time of the former uh, survey, uh, none of those, I think, requires special mention, except perhaps Nightingale. At the time of the Sitter's survey, there were two breeding sites still in Devon. They were breeding on Chudley Night and Common, and they were breeding in the Undercliffs between Axmouth and Lyme Regis. They've now been lost from both of those sites. And uh, this is part of a general 
decline that covers the whole of southern England and for which we are uncertain of the, re of the re reasons. Nobody really seems to know why nightingales have declined and somebody has pointed out that here you have a species which is common on the continent which ought to be responding to warming temperatures by moving northwards but it's not doing it so there must be something else that is seriously wrong. <coughs> Declines, we have quite a lot of species there. Um, you can see them on the list. There are heron, buzzard, grey partridge, lapwing, curlew, turtle dove, and a great many others. And we'll look at one or two <coughs> specifics here. And one of these is the lapwing. I haven't put up a photograph of lapwings because I reckon everybody knows what they look like. I hope so, anyway. <laughs> um, when Sitters did his survey, there were lapwings in 20% of tetras. There are now just two places in Devon where lapwings breed. They breed in one place on Dartmoor where they're hanging on by the skin of their teeth and don't succeed in every year, most years. And they're also hanging on down on the, X, on the X estuary where the RSPB are doing a good deal to help them along. So there's something which is a really um, dramatic decline. Why? I'm afraid we have to look here at changes in agricultural practice. Uh, lapwings breed in open fields, and nowadays nobody cuts hay. They all cut silage, and silage is three to four cuts a year, at least it is in the field behind my house. And uh, it doesn't give it anything a chance to get through its breeding cycle between the silage cuts. Uh, and likewise, if they breed in crops, so many crops now are autumn sown, and by the time the lapwing is getting round to egg laying, certainly gets round to young raising, the crop is getting rather tall, and they don't like to be in tall crops. They like to be able to see around what they're doing. So there we have to look at some changes in agricultural practices. And there is the rather depressing man of Lapwing, showing that in the past it was all over the place. It was where I live in the Axe Valley. There were, um, there were Lapwings in several of the squares in the valley. We now never see them except down on the estuary and in hot weather. And that's the, that is the present situation. Let's look at another species from farmland, the yellow hammer. This is a small, yellow, largely yellow bunting with the classic um, little bit of bread and no cheese song, which is familiar, or should be familiar, from hedge tops in arable fields. That has gone down from 82% of tetrads to 45% of tetrads. And here, I suspect we again need to be looking at changes in agricultural practice. Um, autumn plowing, so that there's no stubble standing over the winter to provide a reservoir of seeds. And um, no, a lack of winter feed. And there's the map. Again, you can see in the earlier survey, it was pretty well all over the place. Now it's looking distinctly spotty, not, it's gone down a good deal. The next species I'm going to mention is spotted flycatcher, which has dropped from 72% to 30% of tetrads. Um, formerly you used to be able to see these in every village around any large house, particularly one with creepers and uh, wisterias and things growing up in front of it would likely have a spotted flycatcher's nest in it. A drop from 72% to 
and it, it's now starting to look distinctly scattered. And uh, I have to look quite hard where I live. I have to hunt around quite hard to find breeding spotted flycatchers. Spotted flycatchers sit on a perch and nip out and grab insects as they fly past. Are there now enough insects for them to do this regularly? I have a nasty feeling that the long continued use of pesticides is reducing the numbers of um, large insects available. After all, formerly when I went on a long drive, I would have to stop and clean the windscreen. Nowadays, I don't. And I believe the RSPB are following this up now. Uh, my final example is the Skylark, which hasn't perhaps dropped as dramatically as the others. It's down from 93% of tetrads to 63%. It illustrates one or two of the problems. It is very, very difficult to confirm breeding in skylines. It's easy to know that they are probably there because you hear them singing. They're up there, singing their hearts out, and there's no difficulty in knowing they're there. But actually finding the nest is quite a different matter. And so that is one case where we have a great many probable and possible ratings for breeding and confirmation in only 9% of tetrads. And there you can see the change between the two surveys with a gradual, uh, a, a concentration on the rough grasslands and open water of dark. And you can also, here this is the only example I'm going to use for the winter mapping, this we can see from here that the distribution, far from being concentrated on Dartmoor in the winter, has moved away, has moved outwards. And the birds are now in farmland, particularly in the South Hams, they are away from their main Dartmoor breeding area. So we can see winter movement here. So let's look at some of the factors driving declines. Oh, I'm already over time. Uh, silage instead of hay, autumn plowing and sowing, long continued herbicide and pesticides, and one more thing, annual hedge flailing, which must remove a lot of winter food. It certainly removed all the blackberries that I would like to have picked. Um, it's very tempting to blame farmers for all this, but farmers are under huge pressure these days, and uh, it's very hard to make a living as a farmer. So uh, we must be careful not to blame them. Um, factors driving, other factors driving declines, I believe recreational pressures, increased use of open spaces by walkers and cyclists leading to disturbance during the breeding season, and particularly people who let their dogs roam all over the place in the breeding season, as so many do. Um, we also have, of course, to think about climate change, and we that's a very contentious subject, but it's undoubtedly happening. And finally, both of us would like to thank all those who surveyed Devon's birds, Devon's birds in 2007-2013. We need to thank Mike Hansen, who sadly isn't here, for analyzing the data and preparing the maps. And we also need to thank Humphrey Sitters, who again isn't here sadly, for having the foresight to carry out the earlier survey so that we can make comparisons and for making all his data available. Thank you very much.